Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Elizabeth King, and I'm beginning a CTM postdoctoral fellowship under the supervision of Dr. Murray and Dr. Ludvi. And uh, I think this morning's talk made it very increasingly evident of how important aging is in HIV today. And so in that vein, in keeping with that, I'm going to talk about a very important part of aging for women with HIV, and that's the time of menopause. And I'm just presenting the early parts of a, of a project that we're planning for, two, for the next two years. Um, so by way of background, it comes as no surprise to this audience that people with HIV are getting older. And so you can see this in this graph uh, that basically shows the persons living with HIV over age 50. And you can see that this is increasing worldwide, um, but particularly in Western Europe and North America. And this is because of multiple things, but mostly because of the uh, effective antiretroviral therapy that's now allowing people to live into later years. Um, but become, what becomes more impressive still is what happens when you chart this data out for like the, for the next decade or two. And so there's a very interesting study um, published by SNIT in the Lancet Infectious, Infectious Diseases that basically models the projected age demographic in HIV. And what they found is that they found by 2030, it's estimated that 70% of persons living with HIV in developed countries will be aged 50 or over. And so you can see the, the rationale behind the UN AIDS declaring an urgent research focus on aging in, in HIV and on this important increasing demographic. Now, women are an important part of that demographic. Um, women with HIV represent more than 50% of the global populace of persons living with HIV. And importantly, women have a high burden of age-related comorbidities. And so we heard about the accelerated cardiovascular disease that we see in this population. They also have a high burden of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, but the burden that I want to talk about is the uh, association that we're discovering about HIV on adverse reproductive health outcomes. And so this has been a particular interest um, that I've taken with the Oak Tree Clinic and Dr. Murray, and it's also been taken by a number of different uh, research groups throughout Canada and the US. And what we're discovering is that women with HIV have some adverse reproductive health outcomes, which include um, higher rates of, uh, of um, abnormal menstrual disturbances, um, higher rates of prolonged amenorrhea, and increased infertility rates. So this drew us to formulate an underlying hypothesis that perhaps there's some degree of hormonal dysregulation in these women that's causing these downstream effects on their reproductive health. And there has been some preliminary evidence on this. this there's been a study that showed that on average women with HIV have lower estrogen levels, but certainly this is an area that needs further uh, research. And once we see these reproductive health outcomes early in life, we started to wonder what, how this is reflected later in life. And so that's when we enter into the question of menopause. Um, now, menopause is very closely related to sex hormone levels and is essentially characterized by decreasing levels of, of many sex hormones, but most notably estrogen. And so you can see in this um, diagram of the stages of menopause, that estrogen starts to fall. It usually is stable during reproductive life, and it starts to fall and result in women's periods becoming more infrequent uh, in a process known as perimenopause, which then progresses to women's stopping to have menses completely for up to 12 months, which defines menopause itself. And as we see these declining levels of hormones, we also see the emergence of the symptoms of menopause. Um, and so the symptoms are a number of nasty symptoms. Um, vasomotor are probably the most common, commonly known, um, and that's hot flashes and night sweats. Um, but essentially these symptoms are what give menopause its bad reputation and it, um, they cause adverse effects on women li living or on women's lives and their quality of life. So essentially this was the basis when we started wondering about hormonal dysregulation in women living with HIV, we started wondering whether or not that might relate to women's experience of the symptoms of menopause in HIV. And this has been looked at in a few different studies. Um, and so some studies um, have shown that women living with HIV have heightened menopausal symptoms. Um, others actually fail to confirm this association, but all of these um, studies are quite limited because they all take a cross-sectional approach at the um, symptomatology in menopause, 
whereas really this is a long-term transition that can last for up to 10 years. Um, symptoms in menopause are important for everybody. Um, they're very closely linked to um, quality of life. Um, but for women living with HIV, they may also affect HIV care. And there's been a study that looked at severe menopausal symptoms and linked this to women not taking antiretroviral therapy. And then finally, the treatment of menopausal therapy or menopausal symptoms. Um, the first line treatment is menopause hormone therapy, um, which is very efficacious. However, we have some preliminary unpublished data that suggests that Care providers are quite reluctant to use this therapy in the setting of HIV for a number of reasons, um, and that this is likely underutilized in this population. So this basically sets the stage for our study um, and for our hypothesis. And our overall hypothesis is that menopausal symptoms are more severe in women living with HIV and they're undertreated compared to HIV negative controls. Um, so once again, our hypothesis in pictorial form is here, and we propose three study aims. So um, our first study aim will be to first establish what the severity of menopausal symptoms is in HIV positive populations. And then we'll go on to look at factors that may mediate the severity of symptoms and women's experience of their symptoms, including psychosocial factors and illicit substance use. Uh, which may also relate to some of these um, hypotheses of hormonal dysregulation. Our second aim will be to look at um, the hormonal levels throughout the perimenopause and menopause transition and to try to relate these to severity of symptomatology. And then our third um, aim will be to look at menopause hormonal therapy in this population. And so we're very fortunate to have two very robust and complementary cohorts to work, work with in this study. Um, and so we'll be uh, able to use data from the KARMA cohort, which is a BC-based cohort, which has a large variety of reproductive and hormonal data. And then we'll also be making use of the CHIWOS cohort, which is a can-Canadian uh, cohort that has a large amount of uh, menopause, or menstrual and menopausal symptom data collected over three different time points longitudinally. I'm going to briefly go into this, but I'd be happy to answer more questions about this after. But essentially, we'll be defining menopause based on menstrual cycle stages, which is the very uh, common and standard way of defining this in literature. And we'll base our inclusion and exclusion criteria um, on this um, definition. So then I wanted to briefly go through our three aims. And once again, I'm happy to answer more uh, specific questions about these aims in the question period. Um, but essentially, aim one is to look at the severity of menopausal symptoms in a cohort longitudinally. And so we'll be using the CHIWOS co cohort for this, and we'll be using a standardized scale called the menopause rating scale, which essentially rates the symptoms of menopause. We'll first be looking at the severity of menopausal symptoms in HIV, in women living with HIV, and compare this to controls. Then the next part is we'll be going through the symptoms at each stage of the menopausal transition. This is something that's never been done before, and it will really give us a natural history of the symptomatology that we would expect in women living with HIV and will help us to be able to better manage this in the future. And then similarly, we'll be looking at risk factors associated with severe symptoms. Our second aim is really our hormonal assessment of this population. And so we'll be using Karma and BCC3 data for this part. Um, we have a number of uh, collected measurements of hormones. We'll, we'll mostly focus on FSH and estradiol for this part of the assessment. And then we'll be looking at vasomotor symptoms. And essentially this part of our study is our first aim is to look at whether estrogen levels um, correlate or with HIV status. Um, with the hypothesis that estrogen levels are lower in women living with HIV. And then we'll move on to take a look at estrogen levels and how these relate to vasomotor symptoms. Our third and final aim is to look at the menopausal hormonal therapy use uh, currently in these large Canadian populations uh, or population cohorts. Um, and so we'll be using Chiwos cohort and Karma and combining the data. And what we'll essentially be looking, first of all, is to describe the prevalence of um, menopause hormonal therapy use in women living with HIV and compare this to HIV negative controls. 
And then after that, we'll go on to describe some of the demographic characteristics of those patients who are being um, more commonly treated, including ART regimens. And so we hope that these three aims will really come together to help us to understand the reproductive complexities um, of healthy aging in, in HIV. And we're hoping that this will translate to the clinical setting and will set the stage for further interventional trials, uh, such as looking at menopause hormonal therapy use in this population. And taken together, we really hope that this will help to tailor a model of care specific to the unique needs of this population. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time, and I'd like to extend a warm thank you to CTN for supporting this research, as well as to my supervisors, Dr. Murray and Dr. Lutfi, and a number of other mentors and supervisors listed there, as well as the Karma and Chiwo study groups. And I'd be happy to answer questions.